Gun rights lawyer Matt LaRossi explains why he believes the Second Amendment covers illegal immigrants. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also a CNN contributor and the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over and sign up for our free weekly newsletter today if you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America. Uh, This week, we are going to talk about a story that I think has uh, gotten a lot of attention on the site, and we've had some really good analysis pieces uh, on it, but it's over whether or not illegal immigrants have Second Amendment rights. Uh, whether the Second Amendment protects their right to uh, keep and bear arms. Uh, to do that, we have one of those authors of one of those analysis pieces. Matt LaRosiere is on the show with us today, gun rights lawyer based out of uh, Florida. Welcome to the show, Matt. Uh, how are you doing? Hey, Stephen. Good to see you. I'm good enough. Yes, yes. Uh, tell people a little bit more about yourself before we get started here for anyone who might not know who you are. So I'm a career gun industry person. I've been a, a gun lawyer for, I don't know, <laughs> a minute now. I've worked for some of the major groups and and now I'm kind of on my own um, doing, still working with some state-based groups and otherwise and bringing my own lawsuits. Uh, I successfully brought a challenge to the pistol brace rule here in the Southeast in Florida. Uh, I, I run a YouTube channel called FUD Busters where I focus on breaking gun myths and misconceptions. And I also work with the 3D printed gun community. Uh, I design some printable firearms and stuff like that. And I do firearms industry consulting. So I kind of do the gun industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're all over the place. Um, but you wrote an analysis piece for us based on a federal court ruling as a district court ruling that uh, found that a, a nonviolent uh, person who was in the country illegally, who had been arrested for having a gun, uh, that they are protected by the Second Amendment and that their rights have been um, infringed on by this federal law. There's a part of the Gun Control Act, the prohibited person section that applies to uh, anyone who's in the country unlawfully. Um, can, can you just give us a little bit of the, the background on that case in particular? What did the judge, where, where did they come down? So the interesting thing about this case is it involves an individual who lives in Chicago, right? Who's just like, he's been here for quite some time, for years. He's got a job and he just wanted to have a handgun to protect himself because, shocker, he lives in Chicago. Yeah. And, and it uh, was 2020 as well, right? It was when he, he obtained the gun, right? Yeah. And so like that was a time where if you didn't have a handgun, you were probably pretty stupid. Uh, so he acquired a handgun and, uh, that is the only thing he was doing that was even remotely illegal, right. That we know of is be here, uh, which is something that is not a felony. And in fact, wasn't even a misdemeanor until fairly recent memory. So the question is basically consistent with Bruin's standard of if something violates or runs afoul of the plain text of the second amendment it has to you know it can only carry the day constitutionally if that type of restriction is consistent with the historical tradition of firearms regulation meaning there has to be a substantial historical analog to that prohibition so the the question is Is there a analog to categorically denying the the right to possess a firearms to a nonviolent class here? Like, you know, the particular class we're saying is people who are here uh, either unlawfully or under a non-immigrant visa. Right. That's that's what the law section says. And I think the, the court correctly pointed out that. There's no historical tradition of this, and the the historical laws that the government pointed to in trying to defend itself were not really analogous because the the government relied predominantly on laws uh, covering disarmament of British loyalists. And then when you actually scratch the surface a little bit, uh, yeah, they would disarm British loyalists, but it was repairable 
very easily like their their local court could they could go to their local court and be like i promise i am done being a loyalist <laughs> you know uh and that was that whereas here it's oh well how can you get your rights restored if you're an illegal immigrant oh well we'll, we'll come here legally okay and so how do you do that well if you're a member if for many people it's you know wait for about 110 years so that's the the short answer is there's no way to fix it. So there, there really isn't a connection there. Hmm. Uh, now we we also had another uh, gun rights lawyer, Costas Morris, who's been on the show before, write a, a sort of counter analysis piece to yours, uh, where where he argued that uh, perhaps there's this um, similar to what the government argued in this case, but that that there's um, a political community that you have to be a part of in order to benefit from the protections of the second amendment that you know the the people uh, are the ones who have the right to keep and bear arms and if you're not a member of the people uh as a sort of um philosophical i guess conception then you're out you fall outside of those protections uh, wh right. what would you say to that that basic concept so the most glaring issue there is that the people is not referred to only in the second amendment context it's referred to several times in, in the Bill of Rights. So in order to for that to hold water, you have to answer the obvious question of, OK, well, then who. So number one. Who is the people identified in the Second Amendment? Number two, who is the people identified in the Fourth Amendment and in the the other time this reference, I believe, the, the Ninth Amendment, et cetera. Um, and so when these are all referenced. OK which ones are different and why so it would have to be that it's it's either that the other three times it's used uh, it means something else right and it's consistent for those other three times and the case law would show that it's consistent right um but it's different in the second amendment context so the the, the then question is well why why is it different in the Fourth Amendment context than the Second Amendment context? And they've that's never been explained. Uh, so that's that's an so issue. But so in your mind, uh, on that point, real quick, uh, I mean, I, I've heard that argument before, right? But more more in uh, response to like the collective right right uh, conception of the Second Amendment that it's not really guaranteed to individuals the right to keep and bear arms. It's sort of a uh, it's guaranteed to militias or state militias or something of that nature. And and I've heard this argument about the people come up uh, in that context where, you know, we don't say that about other sections of the Bill of Rights where where rights are, are guaranteed to the people yeah. uh, or, or protected for the people. Um, and so. So, yeah. Well, what is your conception, I guess, of the people then in, in that sense? So I think we, so, so you're asking what what do I think the people means? Yeah, do, so you're you're saying that the people um, includes uh, illegal immigrants, people who are in the country overstate a visa, or they cross the border illegally, or what you know what have you. They right. they don't have um, a legal status in the United States. Uh, you're saying that that does include that they are included in the people. Like, where, what right. are the boundaries of the people in, in your uh, understanding? So you you have to in order to read the, the constitution consistent with all of the frameworks that we have for analyzing first amendment cases, second amendment cases, fourth amendment cases, you have to read it in the, in the context of the time it was written. And so let's think about that broader context. The word citizen is used like, I think 11 times in the original constitution. Um, they used different terms very intentionally. And so, at the time of the founding, when these rights would have been most acutely understood, a citizen only mattered, right? Like, look, there was a lot of horrible race stuff, and I, I don't think we really need to drive into it. I think that you can answer the race issue with some people were not considered people, and that was wrong. And we fixed that, and we can apply the those fixes going backwards right because it was yeah. a dehumanizing thing it wasn't a legal categorization thing right you're talking um, about like slave slaves being banned from owning guns native americans yeah you know, well and also the constitution explicitly you know define it right um yeah the three-fifths compromise three-fifths compromise okay. yeah I got so it. 
though that's dealt with when we now understand that those are people right and so i think i think it's easy to understand that people outside of the people context is human beings okay mm -hmm. um there's some people might wish that that included dogs or cows or whatever but i think we can all agree that it's all human beings are people right so then the question of the people well when the constitution refers to citizens it's almost always in the context of specifically holding office and so then when you look at well what was citizenship at the time well, and there was no federal citizenship for two years. So you didn't have United States citizenship at the time of the founding. It didn't exist. And then when it was enshrined uh, statutorily, guess who could make you a citizen? Any court, any common law court. So you could go to what is equivalent now, like your local magistrate, and all you had to do was say, hey, I'm a white freeholder and I've been here for two years. And then they'd go, cool, <laughs> you're a citizen. And that's only relevant for political office. So right. at the time of the founding, mm -hmm. sorry, what were you saying something? No, yeah, and, and so that's very, very different from how we yes. uh, bestow citizenship today. Right, because remember birthright so citizenship saying. didn't happen until after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So at the time of the founding, up until the Civil War, it would be the case that most people were not citizens because they would have never bothered, right? Um, they would have never bothered to go and get registered. Like, why would they bother? Why would the, and also many of them weren't eligible to apply for citizenship in their states because they wouldn't have held land. And there's never been any question that, you know, white commoners, couldn't have guns it was it was never even remotely touched on and they were certainly in many instances not citizens of course very quickly so i will say like we did recognize citizenship at birth before the civil war but birthright citizenship happened later on i just wanted to don't, didn't want to leave that issue hang, um dangling um the point is citizenship wasn't magic and it wasn't a precondition for any um human right it was a political right um for seeking office voting and, and things like that so we've we've got at the time of the founding a very clear lineation of a, a political class right and the political class is governed solely with respect to political issues right and that's where citizenship comes in I don't think it makes sense to now go back and say, well, we need to take a new concept, our modern conception of a political class, and force it into the people. Whereas at the time of the founding, citizens would have accurately described the political class, right? So the people who could run and vote. And then there was everyone else. So you needed to have another word that covered like you know that's this isn't just for members of of this political class right this isn't just for landowners and and people who have had enough time and money to go and bother their local courts it's for something else and so well what's a pretty unambiguous way to refer to people the people and i i think the people the only way the people is um principally distinguished from human beings in the constitutional context is is in the context that some people have brought up where like yeah if you have people coming in here under a foreign flag right and i'm, I'm not talking about like this bizarre conception people have now that that all illegal aliens are somehow operatives of the government that they're trying to escape uh i'm talking about the very real threat that you had at that time of actual invasions right those would be people but i think it would be pretty easy to say that you know a legion coming in literally flying a foreign flag would not be the people of the United States, right? So they probably wouldn't get all of the same due process. Right? You know, it would, it would probably not be shocking if a band of mercenaries came in and they were detained uh, without, <laughs> you know, um, full legal process. Uh, okay. so, so that's an important to see. So uh, 
from what I'm what I'm understanding here about your conception of this, um, the citizenship. First of all, the founders had a new made a distinction between the people and citizens in in the founding documents, right? Um, and, and in in the early founding era laws, and because they used the people in the Second Amendment, they weren't specifically referring to those citizens or people with a specific level of political power uh, at the time. And and in addition to that, your your understanding of the, the people as a term, as they used it at the founding, is basically everyone except for people who are literally directly working for other governments in either some sort of invasion scenario, like you've described there with mercenaries or whatever, or I guess diplomats or people like that as well. Well, and it would, it would include like, so you have to remember the other reason this would be important is because native Americans were actively considered to be foreign, separate, like, separate country. Yeah. yeah. And like, and when they were in, because there was a lot of issues with, um, you know, their conception of how land works versus you know early american conception of how right. land worked there was a lot of issues where they would be considered right a roving you know mercenary thing uh so that i think it fits uh so i think the the easiest way to say it is that when these terms were used in the constitution there was the specific term citizen and the general term the people right and so if they knew what citizen was. Why would they not use that term if they meant for it to be limited? Because necessarily, I think necessarily, citizen has to be more specific than people. Otherwise, that's a massive failure in of English, right? Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying if that's what was intended, they failed dramatically. Uh, and then the other piece of evidence is when you later on look at the Reconstruction Amendments, they separately refer to citizens, people, and all persons uh, in an effort to kind of nip this in the bud. Uh, and so, and they do it in that order, right? They do it in the order from most specific to most general. So there was citizens, the people, and persons. And that came quite a while after we just had the distinction of citizens and people. And so if you if you believe that the people is limited to some political community or, or something like that, my challenge to you would be, do you think that the pre-Civil War America, the restrictions that whatever you're imagining to be applied against this outgroup could be applied to a white commoner because they would they would have to be applicable to a white commoner if you're you know making this political community uh distinction interesting um because yeah i mean when you read kosas's piece he starts from the point of and i imagine you guys start at the similar point here where uh the right to come bear arms is a natural right that's uh, you know, bestowed to all people uh, as a first principle, right? It's sort of an outgrowth of the the right to self defense, right? You, the, if you deny the means to self defense, you deny the right to self defense, and and that's where you get yeah, basically your gun rights from. There's also sort of a uh, obviously a, 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 a right to self determination uh, as a as a group. Uh, that that's another the other half of of gun rights as well. Your your sort of self governance aspect too. Um, but he argues that the second amendment is a, uh, you know, a political, uh, attempt to codify that right. And it's imperfect in, in its nature and in the history that, uh, surrounds it, that we have to rely on from Bruin. Um, and, you know, essentially, uh, there were certain groups of people who were not allowed part of the political community, but you're, you're saying that, uh, they may not have been considered uh, you know, like Indians or, or uh, sorry, Native Americans or, or um, uh, loyalists, I guess would be another one. But in, I guess in your ca calculation here, you agree that obviously those restrictions existed, but they were more about, um, uh, or slaves even, more about this concept that uh, these folks aren't 
part of the uh, the people that, who are in America because Native Americans were, um, you know, the tribes are separate countries. And I mean, we still essentially have that understanding today, um, but that was certainly the understanding at the time. And um, and even loyalists were were sort of they were loyal to the the British uh, flag and and so that also puts them outside of you know this conception that you're talking about is that the real distinction that they, these weren't necessarily people outside of the political these are people outside of the country in a certain sense so, yeah I I think that's a more consistent way of looking at it hmm. um, I think even more consistent than the dangerousness angle that you know is kind of this is kind of being ring fenced around, mm. uh, especially considering how quickly you could have those rights restored. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's two things. One, you're either not part of the, you're literally part of another nation and acting for it. Right. Which loyalists is, that's a term of art. Right. Right. Um, or but that's what it's describing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or you're not a person. Right. Right. Like, so like that's they why I consider slaves. I was thinking people. to, that's why I thought it was important to bifurcate the analysis. Because mm. the question is one, are illegal aliens part of the people? Because um, if they're not, we don't need to look at the historical analogs because they, they're outside of the plain text of the Second Amendment. But I, right. I think they have to be. I, I think they absolutely have to be, especially when you look at what were the preconditions for citizenship at the time of the founding. You had to be here for two years. The, like, <laughs> You so you were not a citizen, but you were here, right? And that wasn't illegal then, and it wasn't illegal until uh, we we got all of these. Frankly, the nightmare we have now with the entitlement systems. That's what. That's when unlawful entry became a thing, uh, and then unlawful presence wasn't a thing for decades later. Uh, and and people lose sight of that. People also lose sight of the fact that we were a open borders country until the end of World War II. Um, but I. You know, I'll I'll leave that hand grenade where it where it lies. Well, I actually have one quick uh, question on the. There's sort of a practical aspect that hasn't been discussed much in this yet, because uh, I want to I, I do want to move on to some of the. Um, well, the practical legal arguments and how you think things will turn out in the court, because that was a big part of Kosas's analysis. But um, but first, I want to talk about like the, one of the practical issues that I think a lot of people have with this, the idea of, uh, you know, people in the country unlawfully being able to own guns is that uh, it's much more difficult to tell. You know, I, we from what we understand, this the, the person at the center of this case doesn't have any a violent criminal history. But obviously, if they're not here legally, it can be hard to tell what their history is, where they've come from, right? I mean, that's part of the, I think one of the objections that people hold uh, to the, one of the more reasonable ones, at least, uh, to to this, this uh, conception that um, people who are in the country unlawfully should be able to own guns, right? How do you respond to something like that? Oh, good. And that perfectly dovetails into what I was wanting to get into, which is the natural right versus codification distinction hmm. so if your answer is well sure right they they have a right they're they're humans they have the right to defend themselves but we have to check well <laughs> if that is a successful way around simple disarmament and simple categorical disarmament that that's a pretty damn slippery slope because uh, then it just suddenly becomes, but we have to check. And then where has gone your argument against universal background checks? Where has gone your argument against um, private party transaction bans? Uh, it's gone. If we accept the rationale of we have to check, we lose, we lose the right in, in a vacuum, right? The the thing that makes it a right is that the it's a restraint against the government. You can't touch this. You're not allowed to touch this. If it's okay, we can't touch it after we've checked, right? And then what does checking mean? Does checking mean a for uh, a next check? How often is it a next check every day? 
right? Like the the Illinois thing. Uh, is it a void card? What, what does it look like? Uh, that stops looking like a right the further you get down towards what we're talking about here, which is the only way we can know what crimes you've committed in other countries is to go through the whole uh, rigmarole, right? And, uh, and, you know, like people always say, get you in here legally. Well, like I was saying, for many people, that is a many, 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 many year, if even possible, precondition. And do we want to accept that as being a categorically acceptable precondition to being able to own guns? And I would think that most people who are, you know, uh, hardcore pro-gun people or gun rights absolutists would be scared about that, right? Uh, well, you never know. I mean, obviously, this one of the interesting things about this case is that it's drawn a lot of um, division in the gun rights yeah. community, from what I've seen. Um, and you know, there's obviously a lot of overlap between uh, the gun rights movement and many people who support gun rights, and uh, you know, the, the uh, opposition to illegal immigration generally. And and so this is an area where there's some tension. Clearly, yeah, as part of a it. broad political. Uh, intersectionality yeah co uh, the coalition of, of yeah. the right includes gun rights and opposition to at the very least illegal immigration right um and and so yeah there's been i think that's one of the main reasons this has become such a uh, we've gotten so much attention to this is one of our most highly trafficked stories are the these three pieces related to this oh, that makes me feel thought, proud yeah it was why it was why uh, you know for the for the last month or so that's why i wanted to do a little bit deeper dive with you because yeah. um uh, you know i wanted to hear your your side uh, fleshed out a really a little bit more i thought people would, would benefit from that and um and yeah so uh yeah, and, I, mean, I can't wait to get that. more hate mail um, about what a <laughs> what a vicious and terrible un-american person i am <laughs> well, um uh you know i i i certainly appreciate you coming on and doing this and like putting putting your uh your best effort into it to detailing your why you think this is the case and what the concerns are and what the risks are of, of uh, you know, accepting the restriction as it exists today. Because, well, I mean, and this restriction only goes back to the 60s, right? I and mean, this is yeah, well, the, the 60s when it would have started, but then it wouldn't have had teeth until like 20 years ago. Hmm. So it it's it's really strange. Um, but let me let me tackle one of the things, right? This This has been a highly trafficked story because I think it's one of the few times where People that are right of center have to deal with uh, ideological consistency. This is hard. If you are a mainstream right wing person, this is a hard problem because you, you know, part of this position, the platform is opposition to illegal immigration, you know, right. But you should also like be, hate the NFA and hate the entirety of Section 922 and want it all taken off. So, this is one of those rare times where your your beliefs are, are faced right across from each other. And I think the reason that this is so difficult and hard for people to deal with is because, and people hate it when I say this, but I think it's true. I think that logically arguments for uh, arguments against immigration are the same logical arguments as arguments for gun control. Um, they, they follow a idea that certain entities right certain certain of these things are dangerous and because some of them are dangerous we need to apply more controls to protect us from the the bad ones right and and what is the end like how far can we go well we don't know but let's just try a little more right and see if that fixes it it's and i think that's why it's uncomfortable but it doesn't have to be uncomfortable because you can believe you can at the same time believe that this case was decided correctly, that illegal aliens do have the right to possess equipment that is useful for self-defense, and at the same time believe that they should be deported immediately, right? You, those are not logically inconsistent. That might not be what I believe, but you can agree with me that the case was correctly decided and that the government doesn't get to precondition a basic human right on, you know, like the most difficult bureaucratic process known to man and also say, I do not like illegal immigrants and they should be punished. Like, 
those are those are two positions that you can hold at the same time and no one can accuse you of being inconsistent. It's totally fine. And I think if people accept that, it becomes a lot easier. It also, uh, I would like it a lot because it would mean more people agree with me and I'd get a little less hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, you know, the as far as um, bending the, the coalitions, you probably have the exact same stress point on the left uh, yeah. where, you know, illegal immigration or being in the country unlawfully is a, as, as you mentioned, is a misdemeanor. And it wasn't even a misdemeanor for a long time. No, it was a civil infraction. Right. Uh, so, yet we <laughs> strip people of their, uh, one of their uh, rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. And that seems like a bit of an odd thing to support for if you're on the left as well. Yeah, it's certainly awkward, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, every, everyone's twisted around, I think, from the, the traditional American political coalitions on this particular issue, for sure. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of uh, sort of Permos Carey, because uh, you uh, you would think that would be more of a uh, something that the criminal justice reform people would be into on the left. And, you know, with all of a sudden you the see them joining the right. joining briefs with sheriff's departments to <laughs> say, please keep our permits. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, you know, sometimes guns can can scramble things in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, which there is a bit of catharsis for me in because uh, I I started my career uh, working in an ideological think tank. And so I, it, it is always kind of exciting when these sparks begin to fly, because it, it generally means uh, uh, it hurts because it's working. <laughs> it's mm. generally what it means. Uh, but so let's get into some of the uh, the other critiques that that Costas brought up in his piece, because, uh, you know, again, his piece focused a lot more on the on what the court might do. Yeah. The, the yeah. practical aspect of the Supreme Court. And, you know, we've talked about Bruin. I think you've gone through and given a, a pretty um, at least compelling case, whether I whether everyone's going to agree or not is a different, different question, obviously. But uh, you've, you've got uh, a solid basis for why why you think this was the right decision under the Bruin test as it's been articulated by the court. But there's the question, uh, you know, of how you think the court would actually handle this case. Cause one thing to make clear too, is like this particular ruling is a bit of an outlier. There have been a number of other federal courts that have gone the other way. Um, right. Uh, even since Bruin. Uh, so, you know, there, there's not consistent, um, position from the, the lower courts on this point yet, which is a very common thing you've seen in the, the wake of Bruin, a lot of disagreement. Well, there is a consistent courts. position on uh, denying the right. Yeah, so well, yeah, I guess that's fair. This yeah, is they always follow the same logic. Mm -hmm. And I think, and you know, the question is, when you look at the split, right, because the split is, on one side, it's, well, they're not part of the political community. Mm-hmm. And then we already touched on that political community thing. I think it's important to, to stress that, though. And a lot of what, you know, my dear friend Costas wrote is it, it hangs back to this political community. And then they cite Heller. And it, well, because Heller refers to the political community. Yeah, that's that's one thing I was going to bring up is the yeah. court itself has talked about this sort of conception of, uh, well, you know, the, these the, like Heller, for instance, you're talking about a defendant who was, um, you know, law-abiding citizen um, with no, you know, serious criminal record, and they're they're saying that that uh, they they mention this offhand in describing the kind of people who are affected by the laws they're dealing with, right? In, in Heller and in Bruin, uh, what do you make of that? I mean, they do talk about it, uh, at least in in dicta, you know, in this right. non-binding sense. So the political community angle of uh, was the Heller court grappling with the opposing justices contention that the second amendment was not an individual right. And so basically we had several pages of the court saying, you're being stupid. <laughs> like look at all of the other amendments that we've dealt with that use the same language and that obviously apply to people. And then they said, like, for example, the fourth amendment, unambiguously covers all members of the political community and then the case they cite is one of the interesting cases where something was found not to be fourth amendment protected and that was a search by u.s authorities of the residence of a mexican natural national in mexico so the mexican residence right 
you know, he was alleged to have committed crimes sending drugs to America, right? They said that's not covered by the Fourth Amendment because you have no voluntary connection to this country. So you're not like, why would <laughs> why would you be covered by the Fourth Amendment out there? That is not the same thing as what we have here. In fact, it's the opposite. So I so I think the political community thing was a piece of dicta when the court was saying, you guys are so stupid. Obviously, it's broad. Look, it covers everything except this guy. Right. And then they point to that guy. And this is somehow tortured into political community that like. I don't understand how it got to you need to be able to vote. Um, I, I legitimately don't understand that. But lower courts have taken that and just run with it because they said, well, Scalia muttered political community in Heller. And so that means the, the scope of the people in the Second Amendment is different from what it is everywhere else. And I just think that's like. So so that's the argument on the political community side, right, is that. That right. And then you look at the argument on the other side, which is, hey, we looked at the historical analogs. We think the how and why is a little bit different. I don't think they carry the day. So you don't have to say one's perfect, but which is the better, like, which is the better exercise in reasoning? Um, I think, I think on the side of allowing or, or not violating these people's rights, it, I think it stands up better. <laughs> I, I think there's less leaps, all right? Like logical equations can be reduced to math problems, right? So in which one is there more question marks? And I think there's more question marks on the it's okay to regulate side. Hmm. Yeah, you know, when I when you look at those those mentions in Heller and Bruin of the when they're describing the people involved as as defendants or plaintiffs, um you know, it always seemed to me like they're talking about the sort of, well, if if it applies to anyone, it must apply to these people, right? Because there's right. no question that the Heller was law abiding or that he was uh, yeah. you know, a member of the political community, that he lived here. And, you know, yeah, they, you don't kind have of any of these sort of, questions. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. Like it, it was sort of like a, we're deciding yeah. this very specific yeah. thing on this very uh, core to the basic question uh, yeah. kind of defendant. And not that they were saying oh, you have to be law-abiding, whatever that might mean. Um, yeah. Uh, so know, like or, or they weren't trying to define what law-abiding means. They are just saying this getting, guy clearly is. If you're getting instinct. Fourth Amendment protection, right? I, I don't think law by I don't think the Fourth Amendment was, was written for people who are like habitually law-abiding, right? It was a restraint yeah. against the government. Look at Miranda, right? Right? Like it, so that becomes hyper problematic and and you get all of these bizarre incongruencies if you just insist that for some reason the two words the people in the second amendment was just a, it was just a completely different thing from everywhere else if you insist on that you break our entire constitutional system you literally hmm. break it and is it is it worth it <laughs> i don't think it is now, at the same time, right, um, you know, uh, looking at the court, it's it's not just a philosophical, you know, uh, institution that creates, you know, law, law review papers, right? It, it is a political institution to at least some extent here. And one thing that I think is pretty clear about the Roberts Court in particular um, is that it doesn't it prefers not to make s rulings that have very sweeping change now it will do this sometimes even bruin is an example of it but they're they seem fairly hesitant to do that uh, they like to try and wait for outliers i mean even bruin is kind of an example of this because heller and bruin struck down laws that were not very popular there weren't that many of them left they they did it well after the sort of uh the political zeitgeist had already changed on the issue like handgun if they had if they'd said handgun bans are are unconstitutional in the 19 you know 50s 50s or 60s yeah. it might have been a pretty radical a pretty different thing because the polling back then was was uh much more split on the issue 
Oh, it wasn't like, split. The with most people, majority of people it. wanted handguns yeah. out. It was like, yeah. if you look at Gallup, I think it was like yeah. 60 something, yeah. whatever. But, and then by the time they actually did Heller in 2008, yeah. there was, there were really only like two actual bands in the country, DC and Chicago. And uh, the polling had flip-flopped completely on the, the, the question. And it's a very similar story when you look at concealed carry, where if they'd done this in the 90s or the 80s, Sure, it would have been a pretty uh, aggressive move to right. defend, you know, the Second Amendment's uh, uh, protections that are offered. But they did it in 2022 after almost every state had adopted some sort of concealed carry law. And the biggest remaining obstacle, you know, there was no outright ban anymore anywhere uh, in the country. And now a couple of those were from court rulings, D.C. and Illinois. But right. But, uh, you know, you get the idea that this is at the end of the trend uh, in the direction towards the country generally approving of, of concealed carry. Um, whereas, you know, uh, is illegal, uh, are illegal immigrants owning guns at the same point? Um, you know, I think it's harder to, to argue that. Right. And so would you know, where, where would you expect the court to actually end up on this? Um, and, and, you know, especially with where they you listen to these last couple of oral arguments and they seem a, a bit more, uh, they, they certainly don't sound like a court that's raring to like strike down the NFA or, or uh, go and, and take apart the gun control act by any, you know, completely at least like they might be a little more sympathetic towards nonviolent felons or nonviolent criminals. And maybe illegal immigrants fall into that, uh, that category. I, I don't know. I, I'm interested in where you think, practically the court is going to go now that we've talked about sort of the the legal basis for for your thoughts on on this and what what you think the right analysis is what do you think the actual outcome of a supreme court case is going to be and do you even think one's going to get up there i mean with this case could no. easily be overturned at the next stage yeah. and never even make it i don't think we'll see it anytime soon hmm. because the this is just too spicy it's just it's a very hot potato and I, I think I really agree uh, with you on on how the court has followed the ball on on in the gun rights context. Uh, it, look, after Heller, everything it, it almost didn't change anything, right? And we had yeah. over a decade of just the same crap happening as if as if nothing had changed. And the court wanted nothing to do with it. And we even right now, the court wants nothing to do with handgun or no, with hardware bans. And hardware bans are probably the most important thing for for right now, uh, next to prohibited uh, categorizations. Uh, it, to me, I think prohibited categorizations are the most important thing. But look at the zeitgeist. We have pro-gun people eating each other <laughs> right over it. So I just don't, I don't think this is going to be, I think if we, if we get action on one of these illegal alien cases, it'll be, uh, hey, GVR, look at, uh, look at Rahimi, right? Or, mm. or something like that. Yeah. And I think the ball will be kicked like that for some time because just from a practical standpoint, the, the court is aware of one, it's political leanings and its image and it would also know that i think that if the court were to uh deny uh like were to come down in favor of the government in these cases it would have to dilute the the uh, bruin standard aggressively yeah, yeah. and so they're going to make a tactical decision which is we don't it, it's going to be we don't want to do this Right. Likely because we are scared of immigrants. Um, so let's just not. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think they're at least uh, maybe scared of the politics involved, uh, especially at this moment when it's become such a. Like a top issue. In, oh, in our my politics. God. Yeah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine it, it? Like. What the headlines would say about whatever justice. Right. It, it would be scathing um in the press because this is one of those interesting ones where i think that if the left-wing justices are kind of like in for a penny in for a pound they might as well join on a case like this right mm -hmm. 
And then if you're, you know, Barrett or Kavanaugh or whatever, do you want to be lambasted for arming these military aged invaders <laughs> alongside, uh, you know, Jackson and the, <laughs> and the others? Uh, so it's it's just so, and it's so stupid that that's the type of analysis we have to do, because what does that have to do with the principles of the matter and hmm. what is and is not legal? Nothing. I do uh, think that the court is uh, on a path right now. It, and this is just speculation based on oral arguments, which is, mm -hmm. as we've talked about before, and you well know, not the strongest ground to base anything on. But yeah. I, it does feel as though they're on a path towards a, a dangerousness standard of some sort, uh, which itself, I think, risks diluting. Bru I mean, Bruin is kind of at the platonic ideal right now because no follow up cases have touched on it yet. Right. And yeah, no, it's the, a fantastically principled standard that uh, lower courts have refused to apply. And and you're probably going to get some watering down of it at some point, uh, even a dangerousness standard, which probably sounds pretty good for, I think, the average gun rights activist, because, I mean, if you compared to what how things work today, I mean, you can have your gun rights removed for like in the range case for. Right lying to get food stamps um you know a couple thousand dollars of benefits in the, the irrevocable the forever it, yeah, yeah. And you never served any jail time yeah. you didn't even technically weren't even convicted of a felony but because the potential jail time right. was, was two years you got uh you fall under the the gun control acts prohibited person section and uh you know i they at least oral arguments in rahimi seemed like they didn't think rahimi should have a gun because he's legitimately dangerous and they were sort of less concerned about the the ins and outs of the actual law, it felt like, I, I don't know. Um, that was the impression I was left with. Um, but they were maybe more like they brought up range specifically in Rahimi. And so they're set up to take, to decide those two cases hand in hand um, on a sort of dangerousness standard of some kind. Uh, but it, of course, a dangerousness standard would actually, you would think would probably benefit uh, somebody like the defendant in this case, because Again, there's there's no evidence that they're uh, they've committed any sort of violent crime. We did talk about that issue of you know it's harder to know when someone's not here legally what their background was before they came here. But you know, uh, I, you would think that the a misdemeanor staying in the country unlawfully crime or crossing the border unlawfully um, would be a not on the dangerous side of that so, equation. But yeah, it's it's difficult because you you give all this room so here's the problem if we have a straight dangerousness standard let, let me say it this way dangerousness yeah. is also very like, what is what the heck yeah. is dangerous it's a double-edged sword mean? because what did you mean by this right is it objective dangerousness i think it, mm -hmm. in rahimi it's it's easy because he agreed that he was dangerous <laughs> like you yeah, know what I mean? there, yeah he he'd like, done a lot of things that the court had that a, the judge had actually had a hearing on to determine that he was dangerous. That well, was, and he himself was like, yep, yeah. I am a problem. His lawyer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so well, there's, I think, a great quote from Roberts, who was like, yeah. if anyone's dangerous, it's it's this guy. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's that. But then, so there, that's like obvious, objective. Well, let's not say obvious. Okay. Established dangerousness. Mm -hmm. Right. There's been a finding, right? The subject to evidentiary standards, et cetera. Um, I think that would be almost harmless to the ultimate right, uh, but not completely harmless. Because you have to justify it? Because, because you always wind up having to do some justification. And what does that wind up becoming? Well, what is danger? What is danger? Yeah. It is a threat against something else, some other interest. It's interest balancing. <laughs> it's, right. Necessarily, uh, you know, and I just think like the practical aspect of coming up with a dangerousness standard, which is what they seem to gravitate towards in Rahimi. Yeah. Um, in the oral arguments, at least we, we, we still haven't gotten the opinion and, and I have no idea when that's actually going to come because everyone thought it was going to come early. And that, so this is the thing about trying to read the Supreme Court. Yeah, I just I, you're I'll better off you just waiting until they do something. So, yeah, but, I also. I have a a podcast on Fudbusters that I've repeatedly invited Stephen on, and he should come on. <laughs> uh, but I, 
I just refuse to engage in any of the, of the tea leaf yeah. reading because every time I have, I get embarrassed. So I just, it's fair. So. That's very fair, uh, honestly. But um, I'm going to do it anyway right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know because people. No, uh, no, you know, I'm just like if yeah. you do go to a dangerousness standard, and maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just say, "Well, the text of this law, there's problems with it." Congress needs to fix the law. And they might do that in the you know, bump stock case. Seems like it's heading in that direction. Maybe I don't. Know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. But if they do go to dangerousness, there's just a practical issue of having to justify it under the Bruin standard. It means you've got to point to some historical law, and there there isn't a historical like obvious twin. You know, there's certainly no twin. Right. Well, that's not what's required under Bruin. But uh, yeah, but that means they're going to have. Right. This is they'll the, have to give you something, yeah. and the lower you know, however ten. How how tenuous that connection is will determine what lower courts do with it, right? And it's if there were a domestic violence restraining order at the founding that kept people from owning guns, then it'd be easy. But there isn't. <laughs> there wasn't something like that. Uh, certainly not a direct uh, example like that. And so it's going to be a little bit harder. And whatever they come up with, if they go that direction, uh yeah, I mean, it's going to yeah. water down this, the Bruin test a little bit. I mean, as much, but yeah, because more, more and more you no do that test. Right, and let's say it's it's an objective proven dangerousness and, and it's, you've exhibited wantonness to society, right? Hmm. What about wetland fillers, <laughs> right? Like, right. what about cereal polluters? Is that like, how is that not dangerous? Like, how is that, does that not exhibit wantonness to society? It's, it's hugely problematic, yeah. no matter how you slice it. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. We'll see. I, I do. I, I think you're right in terms of like, I don't see the court taking a case like this anytime soon at the very They'll least. They'll do a kicking and screaming if, if the SG forces them to. And I don't think that the, the lower court, like there, this has been kind of an outlier decision at this point. Yeah. And I think most likely it's just going to be reversed on appeal. And if, might not go anywhere after that we'll honestly. see we will see yes. i will say this case has uh made me feel pretty good and uh and i'm looking at doing my own little one in my circuit <laughs> well that's fair you know there's <laughs> probably going to be more opportunities for cases like that's yeah. one of the things that bruin does allow is a lot more of these kind of cases because yeah. the onus is technically supposed to be on the government not that i don't know that every court is what judge that you way, draw but <laughs> But it does make it pretty easy for especially public defenders. Right. <laughs> Excuse yeah. me. I mean, that's what Rahimi was, public defender. Because yep. you don't have to Who, spend by the much way, money on defense. Uh, with all you just the, bring up this defense. And, with uh, all the, um, you know, criticism that guy got. I mean, he did pretty damn good considering. Considering everything. Hmm. I, I'd, I'd say that's we're in a state of, of flux in the civil rights context that has not existed for a long time. And I think that is something to be cautiously optimistic about. And I think that's also something to keep in mind. You know, you talked about being disappointed in the court, not moving faster on like hardware bans or, or like maybe broom response laws you could put in there too. But there's been a lot of disruption on the prohibited persons front, uh, which is really the crux of gun control in America. That's where 90% of your charges are, are coming from yeah. in, in federal court. Yeah. So uh, they kind of have to, it makes sense for them to try and deal deal with that first. Um, it would, but now they they can uh, you maybe they could take more than one or two Second Amendment cases a year that might move things a little faster. But that Bruin that that period between Heller and Bruin that you're talking about, they took what two Second Amendment cases, included yeah. one being McDonald and the other one being yeah. Say, Saitano, uh, yeah. in 14 years or whatever it was. Yeah, you know, and they were all very, very, and they were again like you talked about. They were this is good. It's not just like you have a one way train ticket. It's mm -hmm. you have one train ticket. It's for this platform. You will sit on this car and in this seat. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I, people need to understand, I think, to some degree, how the speed of the court is not going, is not the speed of politics, uh, right. what people would want it to be. And so it's I, somehow I, even slower. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. I don't know that we're on the in the Heller territory of just, OK, we did this one case for you. We're not going to yeah. go back to this. And they need <laughs> to do a lot. of That's just the bottom line. They need to do a lot more cases. Like, yeah. look at how many First Amendment cases there are compared to Second Amendment. 
cases or Fourth Amendment cases or Fifth Amendment cases, really pretty much almost every other amendment. Which uh, is so funny, especially when like it really blows you away to find out most people sitting in federal, federal prison are there because they had a gun mm -hmm. while they did something else prior. And that if you're a gun rights absolutist, that should make you feel weird. Uh, I don't care how you feel about weed. If the only issue that somebody has is that they um, you know, had a gun after being a uh, jazz cigarette smoker, you should, you should think that's odd. And that's exactly what we're dealing with here. And that's one of the cases yeah. that the court might take up next. Daniels is uh, related to that. That'd be uh, good. Or maybe we'll get, uh, what, U.S. v. Biden? <laughs> in 2024 <laughs> yes no we need we to want protect the spectacle the, side of it we need to correct protect the gun rights of the american crack user <laughs> i mean it's an open question uh we'll see we'll see where i mean if we're looking for the most spectacular supreme court case they want to make a splash I mean, the government that developed the crack i don't know how they couldn't take that case uh, they have to protect their their customers <laughs> Um, okay. Well, if you want a preview of what Fun Busters is like in this last couple of minutes, I think it's a good one. But uh, you guys should, should head over and check it out for yourselves. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and giving us your, your view on these things. Uh, maybe we'll be able to have Kosas on, uh, again in the future and, and do the same thing with him on this particular issue. Uh, if, if that's what people would like to see. Uh, you know, certainly always like to have, I, I thought it was great that we were able to get both you guys to, to write a piece. For sure. they, they both had compelling arguments. Um, and, and so people should read them and we made them free, uh, for everyone just, uh, to, you know, to try and get as much conversation out there as possible. But of course, uh, not everything at the reload is free. Um, you know, the membership helps you access all kinds of stuff that you would not be able to get otherwise. Um, but yeah, Thanks for coming on the show. I've already skipped ahead to pitching my membership instead of giving you a second to, to tell people where they can find more of you. So let's let's do that first. What uh, if people want to read more of your stuff or, or read about the cases that you, you're involved with uh, or, or hear more of your analysis. Where can they do that? Uh, you should check out Fudbusters on YouTube. Same thing on Twitter. I will warn you, Twitter is a much more hostile place. Um, but if you if you want to be up to date on the cases that I'm filing. Uh, I've kind of uh, positioned myself as a one-man gun right org. Uh, I encourage you to join my Patreon. Uh, I post a lot of updates, and there's a lot of inside information there, uh, as well as seeing updates on gun design. And uh, support from people there really helped me to uh, bring the type of advocacy that I think a lot of us agree uh, should be brought. And uh, also, while you're doing that, while your credit card's out, you guys should give the reload a subscri subscribe. It's uh, it's one of the only yeah. good uh, gun news outlets that where where you can you'll read the headline and then um, the body it actually is related to the headline, <laughs> which has been useful because on on my weekly show I do a, a incredible amount of plagiarism from the reload. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. At least you gave us a pitch here at the end. That's yeah. that makes up for it. No, that yeah, we we do try to not fool people, and I try my best as well to make sure that people aren't surprised when something is only for members right i still get complaints regardless is this podcast not members only or no this podcast goes out to everyone but the members get it early oh, okay uh, and they can appear on the show in a member segment uh which you can do by the way for members listening by just replying to your your sunday newsletter which is a member exclusive newsletter that that you get if you buy a reload membership so you know you support the reporting that we do but also we give you real value that's that's what i try to do here like yes the membership you're by buying it that's how we operate, right? That's right. where our income comes from. That's how yeah, we get the money comes to, from to the money of this. Yes. Uh, but it also is not just a charity thing. Like you're getting value for, for paying for the reload. Um, so, you know, uh, if you want to do that, you head over to reload.com and check out our membership options today. Um, and hopefully you like this new format. It gives us a little more space to, to stretch out some of these interviews. Uh, cause the, you know, we don't have to put the news update at the end and it's more manageable for everybody. I think, plus we get the news updates out a little faster, which is a, another good bonus, I think for the audience. So, uh, give us your feedback. Tell us what you think on it. But, uh, yeah, that's all we've got for this week. We will see you guys again next week.